Hello all, I hope everybody's doing well. This is the introduction to our third and final project of the term as we get near the end here. And what we're doing is we're looking at uh, color excess and reddening that we looked at in the, the clusters, the Open Star Clusters lab a couple of weeks ago, or just last week, I guess. And so we're looking at that reddening and we're trying to um, understand um, the distribution of dust and gas in the galaxy that's causing that reddening. So we're, what we're trying to do is form a very simple model and answer whatever questions we can. And in the write-up I gave you, the handout describing the project, it talks about various things that you might look for in doing this, but you can look for other things too. You can be creative here and think about what you're, what you're trying to do. Sort of in theory, what we want to look at is to say, this is a top view of the galaxy, okay? So it's got some spiral arms out through there, and maybe just a couple of main spiral arms. But anyway, you can see we're out here someplace. And what you want to do is you want to look in four different directions and try to see how the color excess um, changes, how the, how the reddening changes as a function of distance. And I've also suggested in there that you look at age of the cluster. Age of the cluster might or might not be relevant for you. I don't know. Um, but let's just walk through the theory of what we would expect to see. If you look right down this spiral arm, for example, you might see dust uh, growing, growing, growing. If the dust is spread uniformly throughout the spiral arm, you would see the reddening increasing smoothly as you got further and further away. So that if you measured the reddening of stars, so color excess, as a function of distance, you might expect something like this. I don't know what the shape of that curve is necessarily, but you might expect to see it grow like that. If, however, there's big old clumps of gas and dust in this spiral arm, and not, and not just um, a, a smooth distribution of gas and dust, what you might see instead, you might see both. You might see a smooth distribution so that this color excess grows as you move further away, but every now and then you hit a big clump of dust, and that causes it to jump up, and then it grows, and then it jumps up, and then it grows, or it might not grow at all. It might just be walking along, walking along, big jump up, walking along, walking along, big jump up, when you hit a clump of gas or dust that suddenly makes everything past it redder. Okay, so that's one thing you're trying to look for. Now, the other thing that you, you would, might see is if you look a particular direction like this, you might walk out of the spiral arm right away. There might not be much at all in here, and you might be able to see the distribution of dust and gas in the spiral arms uh, 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 and say, ah, it grows a little bit, and then nothing, 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 and then it grows, and it looks kind of like this, except it's not due to clumpiness down a spiral arm, it's due to the fact that you're outside of the, the disk of the material where there's a lot of stuff, and then suddenly you hit a spiral arm where there's a bunch of stuff, and maybe you hit another spiral arm where you, you hit a bunch of stuff. So I want you to try to work with this and answer whatever questions you can by looking at graphs like this and thinking about how color excess uh, changes with distance, understanding the complexities that we see right here. What can we, can we map the galaxy? Can, do we have in our, just with very simple graphs like this and very simple things that we can do at the end of an introductory astronomy class to map the shape of the galaxy and see what's going on? That'd be pretty cool. And that's what we want to try to do. I've asked you to pick four. You can pick more if you want. If there's, if there's four of you in your group and you each want to do two, you can pick eight. Um, it wouldn't be that challenging for you to do eight of them, but I've asked you to pick at least four directions, okay? And those four directions, so I, I picked hours of right ascension, so we could have picked uh, galactic coordinates, but we picked hours of right ascension, and to say, so that's based on terrestrial coordinates, and to say, uh, look this way, this way, this way, and this way. So don't pick all four of them. If you pick four, don't pick all four of them right next to each other. Spread them out around the sky. Look in different directions. So you're looking in very different directions in the galaxy. If you want to pick six, if you want to pick eight, that would be fantastic. Um, but I would say minimum four. And to look to make this kind of distribution and to understand what's going on. 
Now, I've asked you to think about other complications in the data. Nothing's ever as simple as it seems, and there are other things that we want to, to try to cut on. So um, if you look at the handout, uh, so first of all, you're going to something called the BDA catalog, the web version of the BDA catalog. The BDA catalog is an old catalog of stellar properties, and the web version is, is WebDA, W-E-B-D-A, and the web address is in your in your handout, and you're going there to find the properties, and it talks you how to walk through the navigation of that site to pick open star clusters. So we're picking open star clusters because we know the distances and the ages of these, just like we've talked about before. Star clusters are very powerful tools for us studying stellar evolution, and then as we looked at in the other lab last week where we looked at the distributions of clusters on the sky, they're also powerful tools for us in studying um, the, the, the shape and the, the structure of the galaxy. And so that's what we're continuing here with this project. So definitely go back and look at those two labs that we did. Think about what you wrote up. for the, Look at your write-ups for those two labs that we did last week. And what you want to see that, that really feeds you into this project is to think about doing this. So you pick these different directions. You do this. You go to, you go to WebDA and you pick uh, four, uh, these, these four or six or eight or ten or I don't You pick all of them. If, you, if you're just gung-ho and want to go, pick every. And I've recommended breaking it into two hours of right ascension. A two-hour chunk, a two-hour chunk, a two-hour chunk, and a two-hour chunk. You might, be, you might be able to get away with just doing one-hour chunks. Because if there's enough data, if you have enough star clusters in a single hour of right ascension, then you're looking at a narrower. See, if you look, pick a two-hour right as, hours of right ascension, recognize that you've got a fairly broad cone. Uh, of, you're not looking in one direction. If you could do it a half an hour of right ascension, you've got a much narrower, much narrower cone you're looking at when you look out through space. So you want to actually make that as small as you can, but you've got to have enough data to make a graph like this. So this is the artistry of doing an astronomy project. This is, this is what I do with research students when we go into the lab every day, is we think about our projects and we think about how we're going to work on things, and, and we figure out, you know, we have this trade-off. We need enough data in whatever direction we look to be able to do the project we want to do, but if we tuck the whole sky, then we're not looking in different directions of the galaxy. So we want to narrow that focus down as much as we can. I leave it to you to decide. If, can you do single hours of right ascension? Can you do half hours of right ascension? Uh, one and a half hours of right ascension? Can one and a half hour chunks or two hour chunks or whatever you, you want to do along there? And then um, this is, uh, if you go to step five, so that was step four, um, where I said select four two hour ranges. I've just told you, you don't have to select four two hour ranges. You might select more than four and they might not be two hour ranges. Uh, your project, you make that decision and you decide. This is just a guide to help you think about what you want to do to select the data and, and, and process the data. Step five in the handout really runs you through a lot of things that we want to do to cut the data. And so some of the, the first cut we make on the data is to say, if the boxes, so that you look at these clusters, you've gotten to these clusters, and you've, you, you're in, in the WebDA site, and there's all kinds of data related to these clusters. Some of them, you will note, have a lot of the boxes filled out with a lot of information, and some of them, you will note, will just have one or two boxes filled out, not much information at all. Just first to cut, just get rid of all those that don't have much information. It means we haven't studied them very much, okay? We don't really know as much about those clusters. Let's just, let's just get rid of those, okay? Then I made a recommendation that you cut on the gal galactic latitude. So if, if longitude, longitude measures direction around the galaxy this way, just like longitude on Earth would, latitude measures where you are up and down vertically this way, just like latitude would on Earth. And if you have a very high latitude for a cluster, that means it's gotten outside of the disk vertically, uh, or it's threatening to get outside of the disk vertically. So I recommended a cut on that. You might choose a different cut. I don't know. But just to make sure that if you want to be looking through the disk of the galaxy, you don't want to pick something that's up out here and you look, you miss the disk of the galaxy up and down. So that's why we have a cut on galactic uh, latitude, at least a cut that I've suggested. Again, it's your project. You decide how you want to process this data. Um, so so a, a cut on galactic latitude that way seems to make sense. And then I've suggested that you... Um, record the ages of these clusters. And my thinking there was this. You, you might, if, if you're looking at clumpiness, 
of the material that's causing jumps in these reddening, it's possible that some of that could be intrinsic to the cluster and some of that could be extrinsic to the cluster. You could have clumps outside the cluster, but a cluster itself could be embedded in a clump of gas. After all, the clusters were formed in a, cl in a cloud of gas. And in fact, it would be my guess that the very, very youngest clusters probably still have quite a shroud of, of gas and dust around them, and you might see excess reddening associated with the clusters that are very young. So then, I, I've asked you just to explore that space. You could look at color excess as a function uh, of age, but you probably want to look for color excess as a function of age as a function of distance. And that is to say, you don't make this graph for all of the clusters in a particular direction, because the clusters that are very far away are, of course, going to be redder than the clusters that are close. So you probably only want to look at the clusters that are in a narrow slice of distances. And in that range, can you find three or four or five or eight or ten clusters that have um, a range of ages? And can you see the reddening varying as a function of age in that narrow slice of distance. So slice the distance narrowly and then look for a, a function of, of age. You particularly, I think, want to be looking for young clusters. Can you find young clusters that appear to be um, causing you issues with this? And then you might want to cut them out of your analysis. You might want to say, okay, I want to get rid of all clusters that are younger than this um, to say, first of all, I've learned something. There does appear to be some evidence of reddening that's intrinsic to the cluster. So that's something you write up and that's something you tell the world, hey, I've learned something. And then if I want to find how it, how it, what the extrinsic, what the, the external dust is doing, then I better cut out those that are really polluting my data. Um, similarly, if you could get away with just making a narrow age range, I say, I only want clusters in this narrow age range when I look at the function of distance, do that. So, so then you can do that. But you see how you, you start making these cuts that make sense and you end up with no data. And so, again, we're back to this balance of being able to have enough data to answer the question that we want to answer, but at the same time, do we have, uh, uh, do, 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 are we not including so much junk that the, the data is so messy that we can't figure out? Now, there are serious statistical uh, mathematical tools we could use to help us decipher this. Uh, obviously, we're not going to do that. Uh, it would take us all semester to build up to that, to, to, to say, you know, if we were in a stats class, we would, we, would, we would develop some tools to help us do this, pulling apart of the different things that are going on in there, um, rather than trying to do this this way. But you're getting at the heart of it by doing it this way. Um, so then, uh, so, so, so then you figure out how you can slice your data the best in order to answer the questions that you want to answer without polluting it with other things. So you're, you're making a whole series of graphs, a whole difference of slices of ages and slices of distances and so on. And it turns out that the answer in one direction may not be the same as the answer in another direction. So you might have to do this work in each of the four directions or six directions or eight directions that you've selected. Now, if you want to, it is possible for you to go out and find on the web a map of the spiral arms of the galaxy and understand what the orientation of our galaxy is in terms of right ascension and declination. And you might be able to then say, oh, okay, I see uh, the orientation of the galaxy. And you might be able to understand whether you're looking down a spiral arm in a particular direction, whether you're looking perpendicular to a spiral arm. And you might be able to predict, if that's the case, can you lay a map of the galaxy over the top of the over the top of the, the right ascension grid to say, okay, I would predict at this distance, you know, we're here, at this distance D right there, I should see a sudden uptick in reddening if it's associated with a spiral arm. So if you have a chance to do some of that work, I would recommend trying to do that work. That's next leveling up uh, this analysis is to say, oh yeah, I can see that actually. I saw a big jump when I got to this distance. That makes sense to me because there's a spiral arm that we ran into out that direction. So there's whole array of ways you can analyze this data um, and then figure out what's going on. So I'd like for you to, to be creative and think about possibilities like this and talk to me about possibilities like this as you're working on it. Um, and so do, do this work. Write a good, uh, good summary. Give me a bunch of graphs, a bunch of, bunch of sketches like this. You know, give me top view sketches of the galaxy, side view sketches of the galaxy, and, and can give me some figures like this. Um, if, you, if you use, you know, if you get this data online, uh, you got to reference it, of course. You got to do good references to make sure you're letting me know where you're getting this stuff. And so 
um, do all of this work and talk to me about the analysis you're doing and see what you can figure out. I think we have the chance to make a pretty good model of the, of the galaxy here in the, the last couple of weeks of the semester, and I think it would be an interesting, fun project for us. So let's try that and see what we have going on. Uh, good luck with it, and we'll see you all very soon.